What's up, guys? If you're not subscribed, please subscribe. Also, please smash that like button on the video and enjoy the show. Nothing in the Bible really is an infinite empty void, so it's like empty space. What do you mean by that? Well, I'm, if you read the Bible, the nothingness was an empty void. And if you think uh, the best example of that is like space with nothing there. But then where did the space come from? Yeah. And, and so when I talk about a universe from nothing in, in the book, what I really meant, and I still mean, is no space, no time, everything that we see and everything in the universe that we see within the universe and the space and time that comprises our universe did not exist. And then it suddenly came into existence. And now, how did that happen? Well, <laughs> I can tell you plausibly how it happened. Okay. Because we don't have a theory of quantum gravity, but if you if gravity is qu is governed by quantum mechanics, gravity, well, quantum mechanics things says that things are fluctuating all the time. The variables of of, the, of quantum mechanics, and in, in gravity, if it's a quantum theory, the variables of gravity are space and time. Mm. So if gravity is a quantum theory, then then virtual universes, virtual space times. Think of the universe as like a ball. They can pop into existence and go out of existence in a short time. It ha that's what happens right now. If you take space right now, it's full of virtual particles popping in and out of existence. We know that. We can't measure them directly because they're virtual, but they produce effects that you can measure. And we can mm. predict those effects, and they're the best measured predictions in all of science. The properties of atoms, the spectra of atoms, we can predict to, in some sense to 11 decimal places and if you didn't include the effect of virtual particles, you get the wrong answer. But when you do, you get the right answer. It's the best measured prediction in all of science. So we know these virtual particles pop in and out of existence, and they determine the properties of atoms. They determine the properties of elementary particles. But if, if gravity is a quantum theory, then virtual universes are popping in and out of existence all the time. Most of them, you know, are... It, it, in, in existence for a fraction of a second. I mean, unbelievably small fraction. Like in our time. Well, even in our time, they could exist and, and go out of existence. But some of them can exist for a long time if they have zero total energy. Because if, they ex if you have a virtual particle that suddenly exists and continues to exist, it violates energy conservation, right? If the mm. particle had a mass, that's why they have to disappear in a time so short you can't measure them. But in certain conditions, like near a black hole, as Stephen Hawking showed, virtual particles and antiparticles can spontaneously appear, but one of the particles can fall into a black hole, losing more energy than the rest mass of the particle that remains, so you don't violate energy conservation, and black holes evaporate. That's called Hawking, Hawking radiation, okay? Is there, a now, way to, is there a way that we prove that? No, right now we, I mean, first of all, you don't really prove things in, to be true in science. You prove them to be false, mm. okay? But you could at least measure it. And we can't measure Hawking radiation of black holes because we can't see black holes at that level. We can produce analogs, analog experiments on Earth with, with things that behave like gravity, with fluids, for example. In fact, I just wrote a particle, an article in, in Nature uh, uh, about that. And when we do that, we see the, an, the analogs of Hawking radiation. But the mathematics is consistent. So we really think that black holes do radiate. Okay. And for people out there, because I know there, there's a lot, I don't, I don't want to keep cutting you sure, off. Sure, sure, no, to keep have cutting to me off. Stuff. I realize we got to go back to the beginning. But at some stuff, point. stuff like like black holes. Can you just bring people up to speed? On okay, how black that hole. Works? Yeah, black hole is an exotic object, and it's, it's it's got a neat name, which is one of the reasons they make movies about it. In Russian, by the way, it's called a frozen star, so you don't see any movies in Russian called. Mm. But black holes are are a neat name. But a black hole is simply a, a, a massive object that's the gravity at its surface is strong enough that light can't escape. Right? The escape velocity from the Earth is, I think, 11 kilometers per second. So if you want to send a rocket ship up and you want to escape the Earth, it doesn't matter what's on the rocket ship. You've got to have it go traveling at least 11 kilometers per second in order to escape the Earth. It's just the way it is. Okay? If I put an extra teaspoonful of matter on the Earth, then the escape velocity from the Earth would be a little bit greater. Mm. And a little bit greater and greater. If I put enough mass on the Earth, then the escape velocity would exceed the speed of light. But you can't go faster than light. And that really would then say the Earth is a black hole. Nothing can escape. If light can't escape, mm. then nothing can escape. And that's, that was first realized, by the way, in the 1700s by, I mean, not with general relativity, but with Newton's law of gravity by a British, uh, basically, clergyman at, at, in, who, was, who was also ultimately a professor at, at uh, Cambridge, 100 years after Newton. And he estimated that if you had a star that was 500 times the mass of the sun, 
and made of the same stuff as the sun, then the speed of then the escape velocity from its surface would be greater than Whoa. speed of light. So he already and he would call them black ago. holes. What? That long ago. Yeah, but yeah, he didn't and it didn't catch on, but he basically got the number right. A- in any case, so if you have a very massive object like uh, that collapses to be to be small enough so the gravity of the surface is is big enough to bigger than so that the speed of light uh, is not fast enough to escape then nothing escapes. So, mm. And black holes are exotic, but they're not that exotic. The, the smaller the black hole, the denser it has to be to have that kind of gravity. If you took an object, the mass of the sun, if it collapsed to be the size of Hoboken, <laughs> it'd become a black hole. And that's not mm. to say Hoboken's a black hole. Don't, don't, it's but, not. I no, know. But, but uh, you know, each teaspoonful of matter would be like hundreds of billions of tons. That's how dense it'd have to be. Whoa. But if you took an object the mass of our galaxy and said, how big, what would the density of that object be when it became a black hole? It would be the density of water. Not too dense. The density of water? Water, yeah, but there's so much of it that, by, that, that if you have a, 100 billion times the mass of the sun and you compress it to a size so the average density is water, at the surface of it, the gra- gravity is great enough that it's still greater than the speed of light to escape from. Now, here's the thing that's going to blow your mind, I hope. It's a lot blowing my mind so okay. far, but keep going. Okay. Well, if I had an object with the mass of the known universe and asked what would its average density be for it to be a black hole, the average density would be a, within a factor of two of the density of our observed universe. So you could be living inside of a black hole. It's not so bad. Mm. A closed universe is effectively a black hole. In, in general relativity, space is curved in the presence of matter. And the universe can exist in one of three kind of geometries, so-called open, closed, or flat. You can't picture them because you're talking about four-dimensional geometries, but, but uh, go down in a dimension and you can sort of think of a, of a, um, of a two-dimensional sphere, the surface of a two-dimensional sphere as, as a closed universe because you go around and you come back to where you began. In a closed universe, if I looked far enough in that direction, you'd see the back, I'd see the back of my head. Ooh. Yeah, right? Because light would go around. Yeah. So it's almost... It's like a sphere, but it's a three-dimensional sphere, it, not a two-dimensional sphere. It has sphere. the feel of, a f- of flatness. Well, yeah, but you, know, yeah, you got to think about what flatness is. It, it, so, so a flat three-dimensional universe is just the universe you always thought you lived in, one where the X, Y, and Z axes always point in the same direction everywhere. Mm. But in a curved three-dimensional universe, if, if I go up on the Z axis here, somewhere else is going to be pointing in a different direction. Mm. And in a closed universe, it'll curve back on itself... In, a, in an open universe, it'll still curve, but it's infinite. It's kind of like a saddle, uh, an infinite saddle in, in three dimensions. Thank you for watching the video, guys. Please hit that subscribe button and check out this clip's full podcast episode by clicking here or in the description below.